Welcome back everyone. This is the third video in the series about doing research or conducting independent research. Today we're going to be talking about the scientific method or the method of actually conducting research, the general method that applies to uh, finding new knowledge. Okay, So uh, in the last video you might have seen uh, we were talking about asking questions or getting in the habit of asking questions about things in our everyday life, things related to our, our topic that we want to research, um, but just basically getting in the habit of asking questions uh, about everyday objects. That way we're not taking anything for granted, or at least we know uh, where our knowledge stops for normal objects. Once you start thinking in that mode, um, and I, I recommend you go watch the video if you haven't yet, um, once you start thinking in that mode, then you will start to question um, or you'll start to realize where your knowledge ends uh, also in your area of expertise or whatever area you're working on. Where your knowledge ends is where you can start asking questions and questions that are hopefully uh, relevant and interesting. You're essentially finding by doing this questioning process, you are finding a problem, a problem. <laughs> So you're finding a problem, and um, this problem is essentially in the form of a question, right? You you want to know, um, I, I think my example was about markers, you want to know how does the liquid stay in a marker? Um, if you don't already know that, well, that's a problem that you can solve. So what you're actually doing is having making some sort of problem statement, Right? So some sort of problem statement that we're going to be working on. You have a problem in the form, hopefully, of a question. So um, how does uh, fluid stay in a marker? Right? So we have some sort of problem statement or a question that we're asking. Um, this is something, it's not a yes or no question, right? Uh, it is something where we're actually understanding more about the way that fluid stays in a marker, for example. Um, but uh, if you don't know the answer to this already, it's not very obvious how you would find that out unless you make your own experiment or if somebody else knew how to do it. Next, once we have our problem statement and we have a question or something that we want to solve, then we make a hypothesis or a guess about what the answer to this question is. So actually I should number this one, two, hypothesis. So hypothesis here, um, you might have, you, I hear people all the time saying um, I have a theory, but actually what they're talking about is some sort of guess. A theory, uh, the way that most people use it is just saying a guess, hypothesis um, is actually a guess about what the answer is based on uh, my limited knowledge or the knowledge that I currently have. So I make some sort of hypothesis. How does fluid stay in a marker? Okay, well now I have to make a guess about how does the fluid stay in a marker. So um, how does the fluid stay in a marker? Um, I think the tip is um, made of, I don't know, uh, fluid repellent material. I don't know, something like that. I don't even know what a hypothesis here would be. So tip uh, repels fluid. Now I'm already pretty confident that that's not true because I can write on the board, right? So tip repels fluid, okay? So the tip of the marker repels fluid so all the mar fluid stays in the marker. Uh, okay, it's reasonable except the fact that we can actually write on a whiteboard, which already kind of proves us false, but uh, we'll get there. So I have some sort of problem that I want to answer, and then based on that question that I'm answering, I make up some guess, okay? And that guess uh, doesn't necessarily have to be right. Um, hopefully you're right, but um, you still have to show that you're right. Even if I say the tip repels fluid, well, that is... Um, it's possible, it's feasible, like it's something, um, it's something that could be true, right? Um, but that's actually not how a marker, or the fluid stays in a marker. Now, the thing about a hypothesis, a really good hypothesis is a true or false statement. So here, 
tip repels fluid. I framed this in terms of true or false. It's either true or it's false. Does the tip repel fluid? True or false? Now, you could get into some, some details about ah, some parts of the tip do repel fluid, other parts do not. So it's kind of true and false at the same time. But basically what we want is a hypothesis that is either true or false. There's nothing really in the middle. If there is something in the middle, that means your hypothesis is not specific enough. Okay, and then you probably have to come up with another hypothesis or a sub-hypothesis to prove. And then that hypothesis should also be true or false. Okay, so we want our hypotheses, all hypotheses, whether it's the main or the sub-hypothesis, to be true, uh, to be a true or false question. It should be falsifiable. Okay, now, the tip propels fluid. Do I really care if that's true? Well, I hope that I'm, my guess is right, but I don't really care if this guess is right or wrong because once I go through this whole process, I will know the truth, okay? So even if it's not that the tip repels fluid, well, that probably means that I've found the real reason and the real reason might be actually more interesting than what I've come up with here. So I'm not, I don't really care if my hypothesis was true or false. I want to know more about the issue. How does the fluid stay in a marker? Okay, so that's really what I want to answer. And then my guess is this. If my guess is wrong, then I can make another hypothesis. But very often, through trying to show that my hypothesis is correct, by trying to support or deny it, um, I often find why <laughs> the fluid stays in the marker um, as, a, a, as a different reason. So. Um, I'm not too worried about the hypothesis right now. It's, it's a really important starting point. Um, but if I prove it wrong, hey, that's also something, uh, that's also something potentially interesting. Okay. So then next, or third, I should say, once we have our problem statement, something we want to find, we have a guess about what the answer, what the reason is that we're looking for in a true or false uh, statement, then and the next thing we should do is go do background research. And I will have another video um, by background, about, about background research completely separate because it is such an important topic um, that a lot of people just kind of skip over because they don't, um, they don't really see the need uh, to do background research, but it is very important. And if you can get background research right, your, your total research uh, will be much more amazing, actually, much more interesting because uh, you will actually push uh, where knowledge is rather than being a little bit behind where everyone else is. So background research is basically looking up uh, what every, everyone else has talked about um, in relation to fluid staying in the marker. Now, what most people do is say, okay, I want to know about fluid uh, the, the ink staying in this marker. So I'm going to go to Google and search for how does ink stay in a marker? And then I find every paper with a title, ink stays in a marker. Um, the problem with that is that maybe you didn't search for the right thing. Maybe authors aren't actually talking about ink staying in a marker, but maybe they're talking about ink staying in a pen. So for example, I'm talking about my case is a marker, but another author that we found their paper or that we missed their paper, let's say, was actually talking about ink staying in a pen, right? So a pen um, and a marker, let's say the mechanism for the ink staying in them was the same, um, but because I was focused on my marker hypothesis, I completely neglected Pin. I say, ah, oh, pins aren't related to markers. How can they be related? No way. Well, actually, maybe they're talking about exactly the same thing, just a different case of the same thing. So um, what tends to happen is that people have a couple keywords in mind, which is a good place to start. Keywords in mind to look for background research that's related to what I want to talk about. So we have keywords related. Um, but then we also need to look for different concepts that are related to those keywords, but maybe not in the same area as us. 
Okay, so in this case, I'm focused on marker, so my keyword would be marker. But if I look about research, if I look at research about pins, maybe I find something relevant to my marker research, and very often we do. Um, in digital forensics, for example, if you're talking about forensics or you're talking about the way that data um, is structured in a computer, well, looking at um, uh, information theory, looking at uh, compression algorithms, even though it might not be directly related to digital forensics, the way that those algorithms work or the way that those areas deal with data um, is very related sometimes to what we do in forensics, even though um, uh, it's not exactly the same thing, looking at those areas might be related. Um, uh, dealing with like sociology, dealing with people, um, very often it's somehow related to digital forensics because people are the ones using the computers. So if you're more technical, you might focus on actually the data side. If you're more investigation focused, you might focus on the society side. How do people use computers? Um, but then if you're talking about society, then psychology can come into play. So you can look at psychology papers and apply it back to digital forensics as well. So um, my point here is that whenever you're doing your background research, don't just focus on um, one particular thing. This is what I'm researching and this is the only thing that's related to it. No. Many things are related to your topic and you should know a lot about this particular, um, your particular area. You should know a lot about your particular area, but also try to study outside of your area as much as possible and see how that relates in. Okay, That again goes back into asking questions about um, basically everything, not just your area. Now you do have to focus, otherwise you'll never finish a paper, but um, try to gain as much knowledge outside as you can, and background research again is one of the most important things you can do. I'll talk a lot more about it later. Okay, so once we do background research, let's say that we find out that um, people uh, have been doing some research related to this, but they didn't actually find or they're not actually researching exactly what we want to find, or we couldn't find any research on that. We found some things that are related to it, and maybe they help us to structure some sort of experiment. So, once we have our background research, then we start, um, if we can, we try to use background research as a jump point. Um, if we can't, then we start to structure our experiment. Uh, Okay, and this experimentation is basically data gathering. Okay, so background research, and then we start uh, constructing our experiment, which is a whole process by itself. Um, we'll talk about experimentation a little bit later, but uh, building up your experiment and gathering data from that experiment, because we need to prove or we need to show, try to show, that uh, our tip repels fluid. We need to show whether that statement is actually true or false. Okay, If the statement is false, then that does not answer our question. If the statement is true, that partially answers our question. Right? If the tip repels fluid, maybe that's one reason uh, why the fluid uh, stays in a pen, for example. Um, but that's only part of the answer. Uh, we'll talk more about comprehensiveness, I guess, later. Okay, so starting to structure our experiment or design our experiment and then trying to find data from that experimentation. Then afterwards, once we have our data, what do we have to do with the data? Always analysis. Okay, so we capture our data. Okay, and then we do some sort of data analysis. What does this data actually mean in relation to our original question? Uh, sorry, in relation to our hypothesis, and what does our hypothesis mean in relation to our original question? Basically, gather our data, do analysis of the data, and then try to uh, either uh, support or deny our hypothesis. Notice I didn't say prove or disprove, because it's very hard to prove something uh, sufficiently. Uh, think of it like a court. A court doesn't know that somebody um, uh, murdered somebody else, but they have evidence that supports that that person did murder them. They'll probably find them guilty. 
Um, so we're trying to either support or deny our hypothesis um, and with the data that we've gathered through our analysis. Okay, and then the last part of this is uh, reporting. So doing some type of reporting or really what this means is kind of uh, uh, reflecting on what all of this actually means in terms of our original question. So now our hypothesis, what does this analysis mean for our hypothesis? The reporting stage is normally where um, uh, if this alone was interesting enough, where you would be writing papers, things like that. Um, but normally what happens is after your analysis, you get more questions. Okay. So after your analysis, uh, if you're very lucky and you've already structured everything properly, you have a, a good answer, right? Um, you already have an answer to what you're trying to, to show. Um, but what tends to happen uh, is that after your analysis, you will generate more questions about whatever, whatever it is that you're trying to show. So your reporting stage then is uh, reporting about what these questions are and then figuring out how it's going to fit with our problem statement and do we need to generate new hypotheses. Normally, at this stage, we come up with a new hypothesis. Okay, If we don't come up with a new hypothesis, then we probably answered uh, what, what research question we had sufficiently enough, at least. Um, but this whole process just keeps going until you're satisfied with whatever the original problem statement or problem area was. Um, so this is very basically uh, the scientific method. Okay, so very basically the scientific method, come up with a problem statement, what problem are we working on, make a guess about the answer to the question that's being asked, um, do background research to see if anyone else has already answered that question uh, or can anyone else provide um, some support for you to start from. Maybe they've already uh, planned an experiment or something like that that you could reuse uh, to try to solve your problem. Um, and then uh, do experimentation or design your experiment uh, experimentation method and gather data. So do experimentation, gather data from that experiment. Then analyze the data. Um, through this analysis, you'll probably, um, you're trying to figure out, do you support or deny your hypothesis? Most likely, you will have more questions after your analysis. So you need to do reporting, either produce the results of your experimentation or and uh, generate new hypotheses to try to um, talk more about your problem statement. So this is just a repetitive process. You just keep going over and over this until you are satisfied um, with your uh, answer to your problem statement. And by satisfied, I mean you have enough data to support or deny what you think is true. I don't mean you found data that says that you are definitely right. I mean that uh, you found the truth related to that question. Okay. Um, at no stage do I actually... Um, have a particular opinion about what something should be. I have a guess about what it could be, but if my guess turns out to be completely wrong, hey, I, I, at least I learned something. And that might be worth um, reporting, uh, either in a journal paper, in a thesis, in a blog post, um, something like that, right? So as you do experimentation, try to report or uh, give that knowledge to everyone else because people do use it. People do gain a benefit from it even if you find out that what you thought was true is not true. So let's say that your hypothesis is this, the tip of this pin repels fluid. And then you find out that actually I have no evidence to support that the tip of this pin repels fluid. Well, someone else might come along in six months and say, ah, I have an idea. The tip of pins repel fluid, right? Then they're going to do their background research. And if you did not talk about your negative results or um, that this was found to not be true, if you'd never posted that anywhere, 
then the next person that comes along is also going to do the same research, right? So reporting is extremely important for getting the information out there. Um, even negative results, even though journals don't publish negative results very often, it's still very important. So I recommend running blogs or just um, writing a paper and putting it on archive or just on the internet somewhere. And people will find it and it will be helpful to somebody. Um, even if it's only one person, you've helped somebody. And you need to be documenting all of this anyway for your own research. So your documentation is already there. It'll help you to document better. It'll give you practice on writing papers and you might actually help somebody in the future, even if it didn't prove what you wanted it to prove, okay? So negative results, extremely important. I have no bias about my hypothesis and what it should be, um, yeah. So this is the general process. If you stick to this, um, you, should, you shouldn't go too, too wrong. Uh, the places where you can get mixed up um, and yeah, the places where you tend to get mixed up. First off, um, problem statements are normally way too general. The ones that students usually make that I see, problem statements are very vague, very general, um, not actually answering or asking a specific question. Then hypothesis um, is also too general. It's not specific enough. There's no way to test it. There's no way to measure it. Um, it becomes very difficult to uh, even understand what are we actually testing um, if we make a hypothesis that's too vague. So you need to be pretty specific about your hypothesis, as specific as you possibly can be, I should say. Uh, background research, the biggest problem here is it's not comprehensive enough. Most people do a Google search and then find maybe, you know, five papers, skim them, maybe look at the abstracts or something like that. And then that's their background. That doesn't help you at all. You should be reading papers as much as you possibly can. Um, and your background research should be as comprehensive as possible. That will give you the best benefit for your own work. Um, that way you don't end up doing what somebody else has already done before. And um, there's so many benefits to background research, but anyway, most uh, people don't do a comprehensive background, uh, background research. Then uh, with experimentation and data gathering, the biggest challenge here is um, designing the experiment, designing the experiment properly so it's actually answering or finding data um, uh, related to your hypothesis without being biased and um, hopefully as correct as possible. So experimentation design is a huge area that um, is, uh, people think is easy, but it's more difficult than it seems, okay? Um, so experimentation, um, a bit of a bit tricky there. Analysis, um, a lot of people are not very good at statistics actually. So once you gather your data, um, uh, doing an analysis over that data and doing statistics, um, and actually finding out how your statistics or how your data might be biased in some way, um, that's not as straightforward as you think. It depends on the types of studies you're doing, but um, uh, statistics uh, is usually where most people get kind of caught up uh, on the analysis side. Uh, so much so that most, a lot of people don't really do statistics over their data. Um, they'll just say, yeah, I saw what I wanted to see, there it is. Um, but um, in most cases, that's not comprehensive enough and you need to do more studies to actually show that this is uh, a normal thing or not, okay? And then reporting, um, the biggest problem that people have with reporting is not documenting enough. So through this whole process, a researcher should, be, should have a researcher notebook and should be writing down every single thing that they're doing, every single thing that they're thinking, how did they do background research? How did they design their experiment? All of those things should be documented. Now those documentation, that documentation is just your notes. Um, I'm doing this today. Uh, today I had this idea. Maybe I should do my statistics this way, right? Those notes and actually what you did, you should be documenting them all the time. The biggest problem that people have is not documenting everything all the time. So whenever they go back to write their report, they think, oh, how did I design that experiment exactly? Was it a five or was it a six, right? So then what ends up happening is in their reporting, they're not specific about the way that they set up their study uh, because they don't really remember. They wrote a program a long time ago 
um, and it worked for them. So yeah, you guys can can get the same results as me. Just um, uh, do it the same way I did it, but I'm not going to tell you how do I did it. Most of the papers that I read, I cannot um, verify their findings. They just tell me this is the truth. But there's no way to verify it because they didn't tell me how they got that truth or the data is not available and it can't be re reproduced. Um, they didn't tell me how they did their analysis or exactly how they set up their experimentation. All of that should be in your documentation and for your reporting, if you're writing a paper, you should make sure that everyone else can do the same study as you. It's getting a lot better now that we can actually write scripts and then upload them to GitHub. Then people can see your scripts and possibly see your data. Um, download it from GitHub and then run the experiments themselves. So um, reporting, the biggest issue is that people didn't document properly and then their report or their paper is very uh, vague on how they did something. Okay, So those are some catches um, to think about whenever you're, you're designing these. For your problem statement or hypothesis, try to be as specific as possible and as clear as possible um, so you're not, uh, not too vague. Um, for example, uh, on this, just one example, um, if I say, how is this pin? How, or how is this marker, right? What exactly am I talking about? How is this marker? Well, I could be talking about the design, right? The, the aesthetic design, the visual design. I could be talking about the liquid inside. I could be talking about the function of the marker. But how is this marker is way too vague, right? Um, it could be talking about any aspect of this marker. So I need to pick very specific language to describe exactly what I'm looking at um, about the marker. Okay, so problem statement hypothesis as specific as possible, as clear as possible. Language is hard to be very clear. Uh, really comprehensive background research. Uh, good experimentation design. We'll talk about that later. Um, Statistical anal good analysis, which is normally comes back to statistics. So practice doing statistics if you if you're not good at it, and then reporting reporting in a very clear way, a very transparent way, and a way that can be verified by anyone else who who wants to do it, which means comprehensive and complete. Okay, and then if you find uh, results that you actually weren't expecting or weren't uh, hoping for, let's say it doesn't, it's not consistent with what you thought still report that somewhere, either in a blog post or just a PDF online um, or a journal if they'll take it, um, because negative results are really important for the scientific community. Um, whenever somebody else reads that, then they won't make the, the same exact study that you made next time because they know that actually this wasn't already, uh, was found to already not be supported. Okay. Um, so this is pretty much it for the scientific method. It is kind of a, a, a repetitive flow um, until you actually get enough uh, data and enough hypotheses supported to, uh, to answer your problem statement. Okay, It's not just a one, one time through finished. It's very rarely that way unless you design a very good um, experiment or you design a very good, I guess, piece of research then you might be able to do it one time, but most of the time it is a flow. You will get more hypotheses, more questions as you go along. Okay, so I think that's it for today. Thank you very much.